Your sin can hurt yourself, as we saw with Adam and Eve, or even others around you, as we saw with Cain and Abel. But sin is always ultimately against God. Why? Even though Adam and Eve brought death upon themselves in eating of the fruit, God was the one that told them not to eat of the fruit. And even though Abel was the one that Cain killed, Cain wasn't ultimately hurting Abel, he was offending God because God was the one who assigned worth to Abel's life by creating him. Adam, Eve, Cain, they all disobeyed God in their sin. And therefore, God is the only one qualified as the perfect judge to set the terms of the punishment. And today, we're going to see how God chose to deal with sin after it corrupted the whole earth. So please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. And when you're there, please rise out of reverence for God's word. And if you notice that a neighbor does not have their Bible, please share with them. What we're going to be reading today is maybe a familiar Bible story that we all heard growing up. But hopefully God gives us fresh eyes to see this in a new light. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. We're going to be reading all the way down to the end of the chapter, and then we're going to be skipping all the way over to chapter 7, verse 21. This is the reading of God's word. And as we read, try to really soak in what you see about God and how he relates to sin. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. And set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Now let's skip to chapter 7, verse 21. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Amen. You may be seated. If you haven't caught it by now, the story we just read is of the flood, or Noah and the ark. And if you grew up in our church, or maybe any church, you probably covered it in your elementary years, probably here at Good Soil, Or even if you're unfamiliar with Christianity or you're not really churched, you may even have heard about the story anyway. A couple years ago, there was a movie with Russell Crowe and I believe Emma Watson about Noah and the Ark. And that's how popular it is. And it's such a great story where they would even make a movie about it in Hollywood. 
But the reason God preserved this account, this story of the flood in our Bibles isn't for our entertainment. It's not just to tell a good story. He preserved it for us so that it may serve as a warning. It serves as a warning because it gives a small yet scary glimpse into the consequence of sin. Actually, I correct myself. It's not a small scary glimpse. It's a big scary glimpse into the consequence of sin. What is the consequence of sin? And that brings us to our first point. The consequence of sin is God's judgment. It's God's judgment. Now, God's judgment is an idea we throw around a lot here at church as a consequence. And we don't really know what that looks like. But here in Genesis chapter 6, we see kind of clearly what it could look like or a shadow of what it looks like. And we're going to talk about that. But first, let's revisit sin. Sin which started with one family in chapter three, we see it has now spread to the whole earth. Look down at verse 13, it says, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. Harsh, but why? For the earth is filled with violence through them. What is the reason God gives for destroying people, for blotting everything off the face of the earth? People filled the earth with violence. Now I want you to remember from Genesis 1, people were created to be image bearers of God. They were created to be God worshipers. They were called to multiply and fill the earth. That was the blessing that God gave to Adam and Eve. Why? So that the whole earth will be completely full with the worship of God, with images of God. But only six chapters into the Bible, this thick book we call the Bible, only six chapters in, the complete opposite is true. The earth is filled, but it's not with God's glory, it's with sin and violence. Humanity has completely spiraled downward to the point of no return. And the violence of Cain we saw last week has now become normal. And the way God chooses to deal with this is to bring his judgment in the form of a flood to destroy all living creatures. Why? Because it would be better to not have violence than to have violence at all. Maybe you're like my non-Christian classmates when I was in college who asked, is it good for God to judge? And how does that prove what you Christians claim about his love? I understand it's difficult to see God's love in judgment from the perspective of the one being judged, but imagine if he didn't judge sin. Would that be good, loving, or just to the ones who have been affected by sin? If God didn't judge Cain for killing Abel, would that be good for Abel? Would that be good for his parents, Adam and Eve, who lost a son? Would that make God a good God? I think we all know the answer. What we see in Genesis 6 is now a group of people trying to, it's not trying to, they're not there. What we see in Genesis 6 is not a group of people trying to live normally or morally and failing once in a while. What it says is that the earth was filled with violence through them. Everyone has become like Cain, letting their anger run loose and killing each other without regard for the word of God. And what do you think these people deserve for their sin? Do you really believe God's judgment wouldn't be fair? Now here, we talked about it last week, but again, I don't think anyone here has murdered anyone. You might be thinking, okay, maybe if you killed someone, it would make sense to die. But even if someone doesn't kill, if they have no regard for the word of God and live in any way they want, wouldn't God be right to lay down a punishment that he considers as good and just? You may have not killed, but if you have disregard for God's word, that doesn't mean you come to church and it could look like you coming to church and just tuning things out. You're disregarding God's word. It could look like coming to church only when you feel like it or you morally measure up. 
when you misinterpret or misunderstand what church is all about, which is to experience the grace of Christ, you are disregarding God's word. If you are living for yourself and not for Christ, you are disregarding God's word. Before dismissing God as unusually cruel, I want you to seriously consider what sin is and what God's judgment of it says about him. He's holy, he's good, and I think the last thing is we don't understand we see in judgment. He cares deeply about his creation. He cares deeply about his creation because if God didn't judge, it would mean he doesn't care about us. He doesn't care about the hurt we cause other people. He wouldn't care that we're not living to fulfill our purpose as people to worship him. So what did judgment look like in Noah's day? If you look down at verse 17, it says the flood of waters will destroy all flesh. It involves death. Scan your eyes down to Genesis 7, 21. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. When you read through verse 21 of chapter 7, it sounds a little bit like creation, right? The creation account. But it's actually the reversal of creation. God breathed the breath of life into the nostril of Adam. But here it says, everything that has the breath of life in their nostrils died. The author of Genesis is using similar language from chapter one to intentionally show us that God's judgment results in getting exactly what is deserved, which is death. We don't get to participate in what he's created us for. And death in this passage leads to the great undoing of creation. The consequence of sin is judgment and judgment is death. And this is a hard pill to swallow but God is not wrong in doing this. And I think that's the big takeaway we must see. He is a good judge. He doesn't overpunish. He doesn't abuse his authority. He punishes exactly for what you deserve. He fairly punishes those who deserve it. And we all deserve it, don't we? Because we've disregarded God's word at one point or another or we may be disregarding God's word even right now. If we all sinned and therefore deserve judgment, is there any hope for us? I heard a no, but the answer is actually a resounding yes. It's absolutely yes, there is hope. The good news is that the hope in our sin outshines the darkness of the consequence of our sin. And the hope in our sin is God's grace. And that is our second point. The hope in our sin is God's grace. You might be wondering where the grace is in God's judgment. Because after all, writing those standards in that class, I did not consider that gracious at all. There isn't grace in judgment per se, but judgment makes grace more visible more compelling, more persuasive, more sweet. Let me explain what I mean. Where can we see such grace in our passage? There is grace in God's warning to Noah. God is gracious because he warns us. If you don't care about someone, you're not gonna warn them about the trouble that's coming to them but against the backdrop of judgment, we see God's grace through warning. Judgment never comes as a surprise because God is clear in warning us with his word as he did with Noah. God didn't have to tell anyone anything. And in telling Noah about the flood, he invites him to safety. Even though Noah is also a sinner. In verses 14 and 16, God told Noah what he needed to do in order to be safe. He told him to build an ark to hold him, his families, some animals, food for his family and the animals. There is grace in God's warning of judgment. 
So I want to ask, is there something in your life or an area of your life where you know God has clearly warned you, but your heart has been hardening to his warning? Maybe it's the anger we talked about last week. Maybe it's sexual immorality. Maybe it's judging people as you compare them to your self-righteous standards that you can't even live up to yourself. Maybe it's dishonoring your parents. Maybe it's being loveless or cold or hateful to someone else who's hurt you when you've been called to forgive. Whatever it may be, if God has warned you of these things and you're aware of that right now, he is confronting you not to let you know that you fell short, not to let you know that you're in serious trouble, but he's letting you know what's coming because he loves you and he wants to guide you towards repentance. So take God's warnings seriously. If you have any sort of apathy or you don't care and you're here, think about what God is saying, why he's saying it, and if you don't know those things, ask your teacher, ask your parents. Take God's warnings seriously. But I get it, God's warnings are good, but it doesn't really give hope. Maybe there's some grace, but it's not full grace. Because maybe you're in a place where you want to turn away from your sin, but you can't. If you feel trapped, if you're honest, you're addicted, or you're too afraid to give it up, you care more about what people think about you than what God thinks of you. Maybe you hear sermons every week wanting to trust and follow Jesus, but upon some reflection, all you feel is guilt and shame and failure for not doing what we preach here from the pulpit. If this is you, then I want to ask you, who is the one who ultimately saved Noah? Was it God or Noah? Well, let me ask you some questions. Who told him of the flood? God did. Who told him to build the ark? and gave him instruction exactly what to do. God did. And who kept him safe during the 150 days while he was in the ark? God did. Friend, it is not you who saves yourself, but it is God who saves you. Who is preaching the gospel to you this morning? It's not me. God, God's doing that. Who brought you to church today? It's not your parents. God did that. If you're becoming more aware of where your heart has been, who is the one waking you up to the dangers of sin right now? It's not your conscience. It's not yourself or your self-will or your goodness. It is God. Your salvation doesn't depend on you ultimately. It depends on the grace of God. Just look down at Genesis chapter 6, verses 17 to 18. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. What is this covenant? We see later in chapter 8, and we're going to see it next week, that the covenant is that God will never wipe mankind off the face of the earth. Why, because Noah did something great? Because he listened? No, because God said so. God says this before Noah even does anything. Notice the language of verses 17 and 18. There will be judgment that destroys the earth, but I will still preserve you so that humanity can rebuild. You might be too scared to talk about me with your non-Christian friends, but I, won't reject you if you come to me. You might have left me, but I am still pursuing you. You might have broken promises you made to me, but I will never leave you. I will forgive you. God loves you. One thing I want to point out is the following. Noah must have been the worst evangelist of all time, right? And what I mean by evangelist is someone who spreads the word of God. He must have been the worst evangelist 
of all time. I mean, can you imagine someone building a boat when it's completely dry and sunny and talking like a crazy person that there's a flood coming? If that happened today, man, they would go viral, but not for the right reasons, right? No one got into the boat except for Noah and his family. What differentiated Noah from everyone else? Was he smarter? Was he better looking? Was he more spiritual? Was he nicer? No, it was none of those things. He simply had faith in what God had told him. In other words, or again, he had faith. And we know this because his faith leads to obedience. Genesis 6, 22, it says that Noah did all that God commanded him. Noah did everything God said not to earn salvation, but because he believed that was the way salvation came because he trusted in God. Faith led to obedience. So friends, there is a flood coming. It's sunny right now, but there is a flood coming. You might enjoy certain things of life, but God's judgment is coming. Christ will return. And this life that we have, we can't spend it ignoring those who are preaching to us to get into the ark of Christ. This life that we have is about getting in that ark through faith. It's about helping others to get into that ark through faith. Like Noah, all you need to be protected in your passage from earth to heaven is not your ability, accolades, or accomplishments, but it's faith. All you need is faith, trusting that Jesus' work on the cross is sufficient for you. Faith that the Holy Spirit will finish what he started in you. When you have faith, when the flood of God's judgment comes, and it will come, you will be safe. You will be safe in the ark of Christ. No matter what waves would come, no matter what lie Satan tells to make your guilt feel bigger and louder than God's grace, Christ is big enough to protect you. He is so sure you can depend on him with your whole life. And he's the only one we can depend on with our whole life. If you are in Christ, you will be able to withstand the judgment of God. Not because you're stronger all of a sudden or you're, you have self-will or you can improve your way towards moral perfection. No, but it's because Jesus bears the judgment of the Father for you. He takes on the floodwaters for you as if he's the one who committed all the wrongs you've done. Meanwhile, you are blessed as someone who has never sinned, not even once, this great reversal is the great grace you have in Christ. We see a great reversal in Genesis 6 of life turning to death, but it's the grace of Christ that creates the great reversal of bringing life out of death. Before the sermon ends, I want us to look at Genesis chapter 7, verses 23 to 24. If you look down with me, it says, only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. This is a detail we can't ignore. I don't know if you read a lot of stories or watch TV shows, but this is not an ideal ending to this story. Sure, Noah is safe. Sure, his family is safe. But what about God's promise to restore all of creation through a descendant of Adam, which is in Genesis chapter three, verse 15? What about God's blessing to Adam to multiply and fill the earth? Well, at this point, we don't know the answers to these questions, but these are few things we do know. Number one, we know God made a promise to Noah that if he trusts him, he will be safe. And we see that he is safe. And number two, as unideal as the situation is, even though Noah is safe, what we see and what we hope for is that sin does not have the final say. 
God's judgment does not even have the final say. It's the grace of God that has the final say in the story. It's the grace of God that keeps the story going, which is why there's a Genesis 8, and we'll see a sermon from that next or two weeks from now. In your life, there's probably times where you don't know where God is taking you, but you don't need to know everything at the end to trust him. You can trust him, and he will keep you every step of the way as he is doing for Noah. And in your life, no matter how tired or even sinful you are, just like in Genesis 6 and 7, sin does not have to have the final say in the story of your life. It could be God's grace, and that's through faith. Cross seeds, the consequence of sin is God's judgment, but the hope in our sin is that he lavishes us. He gives abundantly his grace. So if you're here this morning and you don't believe in the grace of God or you're wondering what that looks like, make sure to talk about that with your teacher. So let me reiterate for us our main idea for today. The consequence of sin is God's judgment, but the hope in our sin is the grace of God. Let's pray. Lord, it's not always easy to trust in your grace, but as we prepare to pray to you now, I pray that you would allow these students to have a bigger view of not just their sin, but a bigger view of you and your grace. Amen. At this time, I want to invite you to bow your heads and pray. I want you to wrestle with God and ask yourself first, do you believe that sin deserves the judgment of God? And do you believe that there is a flood coming because of our sins, because that's what God's word says. And if you believe that, ask God to help you align your life so that you live in line with that.